गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन गिव मी अ मिनट फाइनल आई फिगर आउट वाई माई वीडियो इज नॉट okay uh folks you'll have to tell me if you can see me i don't think you can see me and that is very very surprising why that is uh if there is some application that is using my webcam and that is why it normally happens it shouldn't uh if any one of you has got any idea why that is the case i will welcome suggestions if not okay uh while i try and figure that out let's get started so uh good evening everyone my name is abhinav agarwal and i am the curator of indica books and today in our indica books live q and a hour we have uh, a very very distinguished personality professor gautam desi raju he is uh, the author of uh, the book uh, bharat india 2.0 and before i talk about the book let me talk a little bit about uh, professor desi raju himself he is presently an honorary professor at the indian institute of science bangalore and he is uh, not only the recipient of several several prestigious international awards but uh, his scientific contributions themselves are very very significant he his work has led to the development of a new chemical concept the crystal engineering wherein he is acknowledged to be a world leader uh, at the same time his original work his original work on weak hydrogen bonding has been held by some to be one of the most influential ideas in the last half a century of chemical thought uh with the importance of uh, this uh, generic component of the pharmaceutical industry in the recent years the work of professor desi raju is of direct importance to the indian pharmaceutical industry and to the general uh, public in the context of bringing cheaper drugs to the masses uh citations are one true measure of uh, a scientist's work and he professor desi raju is the second most highly cited indian scientist today with three authored books two edited books 450 research papers 64000 citations and an h index of 100 now coming to the uh, book okay before that he uh, most recently uh, he has been appointed a member of the engagement group of the s20 or which stands for science 20 which is the science vertical of the g20 of which india is going to assume Uh, uh, uh you know chairmanship starting in 2023 his book uh, bharat india 2.0 has been published by vitasta publications and when it comes to india's position when in in the world when it comes to you know not only its uh, you know geopolitical uh, stat, uh, status as well as uh, its contributions uh, in the field of science and and other areas he feels that what is basically lacking uh is a modern competitive spirit and adherence to professionalism which needs to be added if it is added then india will be able to surpass its uh, you know current uh, present sluggishness and his book is an attempt to highlight this issue with reference to what he believes is the core issue in india an unsuitable system of governance that does not optimally dovetail the economic realities of the modern world with our essential civilizational nature and he has proposed some solutions in this book and i am going to talk to him about the, that and a lot more so please welcome professor desi raju to this uh, to this indica books q and a namaskar professor and welcome to this uh, q and a Namaskar Abhinav nice to talk to you this evening and uh, I'm grateful to Indica Books for having supported me during this venture and for you to 
hold this uh, interview on this uh, Bharat book, which uh, I have written recently. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So I, uh, you know, when I was reading the blurb by an uh, equally distinguished scientist, Professor Subhash Kak, uh, uh, he not only writes that this is a brilliant vision for the nation by one of India's most prominent scientists, and through a meticulous analysis of the proceedings of the Constituent Assembly, Professor Desi Raju demonstrates the limitations of the Westminster model of governance for a country that has nurtured the longest extant civilization. Now, this got me thinking as I read through your book, because you talk about the Constituent Assembly and the debates and the fact that the Constitution uh, itself owes a lot to the Government of India Act, uh, in fact, two acts, Government of India Acts. But on page 190, you quote uh, someone who's considered the father of the Indian uh, Constitution, Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar. And I want to start off with that before we get into <clears throat> other parts of the book. So you quote Dr. Ambedkar, who said this in the Assembly on the 30th of November, 1948. And I'm quoting uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Let me give an illustration. Supposing, for instance, reservations were made for a community or a collection of communities, the total of which came to something like 70% of the total posts under the state, and only 30% are retained as the unreserved. Could anybody say that the reservation of 30% as open to general competition would be satisfactory from the point of view of giving effect to the first principle, namely, that there shall be equality of opportunity. It cannot be in my judgment. This is what Dr. Ambedkar wrote. And we, we you know, very interestingly enough, yesterday we celebrated the, the so-called Constitution Day, which uh, uh, fell on the 26th of November, a day which I think uh, most Indians will remember for the horrific terrorist attacks uh, of 2008 in Mumbai. But coming back to the Constituent Assembly debates, right? What is the nature of those debates in the Constituent Assembly that led to this present situation where we have touched, uh, you know, 49 and a half percent in reservations. Uh, Tamil Nadu has got 69 percent reservations. Chhattisgarh has passed a law which has taken reservations to 77 percent. Karnataka is talking about increasing that limit. And there is also talk of moving uh, any such bill that is passed into the ninth schedule of the Constitution, thereby taking it out of judicial scrutiny. Tell us a little bit about how we got here uh, from your understanding and analysis of the constitution debates and it's uh, you know the government of india acts and so on thank you abhinav uh, i think it's a series of things uh, finally it has become almost comical because electoral calculations and the compulsions seem to be more important today than the original purpose that these reservations were meant for. Now, if you look at Article 17 and 16 and so on, I think the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, especially the scheduled castes, I think were worthy of this reservation protection. In the constituent assembly, they specified 10 years and then they said, okay, maybe a little bit longer. Because there, there is a social question. Members of this community, even after availing of reservations for several generations, still feel that they are socially the subject of ostracism which has nothing to do with, this, let us say, their economic condition even. So that is a serious social problem that we have tried to address, I would say, in a sincere way. Uh, my personal opinion is that the STs probably do not need this kind of reservation. I think it is the SCs who did deserve these reservations and still continue to need these reservations even today. And Ambedkar himself later on says that 
these reservations only give these communities legal protection. And uh, he says that unless society itself decides to change in the manner in which society treats the SCs, these reservations, you know, they have legal and official meaning, but uh, at the social level and based on how they think, it's not going very far. Now, so far, so good. The other complication that arose at the time of the assembly itself was this concept of backward classes. I'm choosing my words carefully, not backward castes, but backward classes, which term, which term existed in Mysore and Madras right from early 1900s. So backward classes, uh, you said. Classes. Now, this is also explained in the book. And by okay. 1920 or so in Mysore, there were two categories, category A and category B. Category A meant essentially only Brahmins. And category B meant essentially the rest. With the electoral victory of the Justice Party in Madras, in 1920 or 21, sometime around then, the reservations were then done on the same lines. Essentially, it was Brahmins and the others. And in my various visits and trips, podcasts in North India, which I have participated in after my book was released, I realized that people from the North did not quite realize the nature of this matter in especially Mysore and Madras. So Ambedkar also says a little later in the debates that unless we included, took cognizance of these backward classes, they would not find a place in the reservation system. Hmm. And my surmise really is that all these reservations were supposed to come under 22.5%. Which was the case for several decades, right? Exactly, exactly. Now, after 67, when the, shall we say, what we call today OBCs in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, started sensing some kind of electoral power that they had. Things led up to the level and there is a close correspondence between the OBCs of North India and the backward classes of original Mysore and Madras. And hmm. then there was that famous judgment, I think, Indira Sani, it was, or, where the Supreme Court said that backward class is equivalent to backward caste. So they said by yeah. very virtue of the fact that you belong to that caste, you are backward. Now, this is Correct. actually a very faulty, it's in my opinion, a very faulty kind of reasoning because please remember that economically and otherwise the backward castes of North India and South India never face the kind of social ostracism that the SCs have and do face. So Sometimes they were, quite me... wealthy. they were quite wealthy also. Huh. Let me just uh, uh, stop you for just one minute. So this Indra Sahani case that you mentioned is uh, where the indication of backwardness was uh, taken uh, uh, to be at a caste level. This yes. is the Indra Sahani and others versus Union of, in Union of India 1992 case. And when you talk about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, or the original justification for backwardness or the need for reservations, I think any community or caste that was uh, uh, that faced untouchability, you know, the yes. evil of untouchability was seen, seen to be, yes. was seen to be as, uh, uh, you know, deserving of reservations, right? Correct. Correct. See, no, see, Abhinav, no OBC has ever suffered from untouchability. Ah, right. Then, then or now, no. And in fact, if you look at the history in Mysore and Madras, 
it was simply anti brahminism nothing more than that because it was, felt that people, it was felt that these people were getting good jobs in the british dispensation something like that correct so so then then, then then you go on to vp singh and devi lal and mandal so let me actually uh, ask you uh, because you mentioned the socialist movements of uh, of ram manohar lohia and uh, jp jay prakash narayan uh, which that kind of that led the whole thing you know <clears throat> because that kind of led to if one traces the rise of certain leaders like uh, uh, the late mulayam singh yadav in uttar pradesh or lalu prasad yadav in bihar they owe their rise to essentially these socialist movements of the 1970s right exactly exactly In fact, I read an article recently on Madhu Limay, which said that uh, forget the name of the author. He said most of modern India's problems are due to the ideas propagated by this man. This is very you interesting. Know, it's, a hard, it's, a hard, it's a hard comment, Abhinav. But as I mentioned recently in a physical lecture I gave in IIT Kharagpur, we have reached the point where we must make hard comments. and stop our usual indian tendency to obfuscate seek a consensus see because we are in a revolution and in a revolution it cannot be obtained by consensus no matter what we we can you know stand on our heads you know ideas especially modern india is now getting polarized and maybe rightly so because it's time to question this after devi lal and vp singh etc it became pure electoral stuff and if you see the situation today it is like that famous limerick where the lady got onto the tiger and couldn't get off <laughs> so the only thing you can do is increase reservations up to 100% and then uh, call brahmins as collateral damage that's all there have been comments made to that uh, uh, you know to that effect in certain circles uh, we won't get into that but uh, i do want to uh, talk to you about uh, see when i was going through the okay let's take a step back because i think uh, i started off with a topic that is very very you know uh, not only fascinating because there is so much of historical context to it uh, and so much of uh, current political and societal relevance to it but i want to take a step back and basically ask you see in in recent years there have been some very good writings and literature that has come out on this uh, reconceptualizing all the reconceptualization of the idea of india there was a, in 2020 i believe there was a book by uh, rajiv mantri and oh, yeah. uh, and harsh madhusudan oh, yeah. and I, i i spoke with both of them uh, it's a fascinating wonderful book you have referenced it in your book bharat india 2.0 you have also uh, talked about uh, and referenced j sai deepak's uh, uh, work on the same uh, topic and he has come out with two books on that uh, your book uh, in terms of proposals it not only analyzes a lot of those uh, problems uh, but you have a very specific proposal that you cover fairly substantially in your book tell us about what led to first of all what the proposal is and what led you to conceptualize it in in that uh, very concrete manner hmm the har harsh and uh, rajiv are both you know delightful people and i have enjoyed my interactions with them so yes they, their book senses that there are different ideas of india and the original congress idea of india is not the only idea of india that we have i think mr uh, who is he is hi deepak he is trying to go back into the past and uh, the first book talks about the bad effect that the british had on us mentally and the second book also has is talking about the bad effects that the muslims had on us in in so many ways if you want to just make a rough approximation but see i am a scientist and uh, for us scientists right. uh, we approach the problem different from lawyers or economists or something we take data but we must propose a solution a scientific paper or a book or something which doesn't propose a solution it's not science at all so if they want to look at the past 
I want to look at the future. Chapters 1, 2 and 3 are merely the background for chapter 4, which gives the solution. Because and those are substantial enough, chapters, uh, uh, Excuse those me. are substantial pro uh, chapters, Professor, because chapter 1 goes on for 60 plus pages. Chapter 2 is actually 150 pages. Chapter 3 is another about 30 pages. So you have devoted a, a lot of space to analyzing, you know, essentially setting the groundwork for I, the I solution I that must. you propose. At least, at least readers should thank me that I have not loaded this book with references. My references are only some five pages or six pages at the end. Actually, I didn't want to put references at all. And my publisher, Vitasta, said it won't look good. So if you notice, there are no reference numbers. I want this book to be read like a, a story book, you know. And uh, unlike my other books, I wrote this in the order in which the chapters appear in the book. So I started writing the introduction, then chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Many of my scientific books I have not written like that. I maybe wrote the later chapter first and the introduction usually at the end. So I want this to be read by young people like a storybook. And one, two, three are important. Very briefly, before I come to four, uh, one is the constitutional history of India from 1896 to 1947. Okay. Got it. Chapter two is the Constituent Assembly. Uh, that's why uh, India at uh, 26 Jan 1950 and the amendments. Okay. So chapter 2 sort of ends in 2014. Now chapter 3 is a slightly different take because it talks about India as a civilizational state. Now this is extremely important because I feel that I've called this a cardinal error of the first magnitude in our constitution. The fact that Recognition of Bharat as a civilizational state doesn't figure. It says India that is Bharat. They should have said Bharat that is India. And as I write in chapter 5, I have plenty of problems with the word India. I have no problems at all with the word Bharat. And I think the younger generation of today have to do this remaking of India as Bharat. So India 1.0 ended on the 14th of May 2014, never to come back again. That's gone. No matter how much the Congress party is trying to stand on its head. They're not doing much of a job anyway. So we have the making of India 2.0 or Bharat is to take place. And I feel we are in the Manthan stage now. What I have proposed in chapter 4 is a sort of a solution. It is not the only solution. It may not even be a good solution. Let people talk about it and then decide. But any country that has come up to a position of dominance in the world always emphasized its strong points and muffled its weaker points. Since 1950, we have always done the reverse. We have magnified our weakest problem points. Our strongest point, Abhinav, is our diversity. And it is our civilizational nature. This civilizational nature is simply absent. And I talk about the difference between Rashtra and Rajya in chapter 3. And also the meaning of the word Hindutva. In, I was very pleased when Aravinda Nilakantan in his review of my book in Swarajya, he, you know, he's actually written a book on Hindutva, which is going to appear shortly. And he says, mine was the crispest definition of Hindutva since Savarkar. So, I mean, that was a big compliment and that too coming from Aravindan. I was really overwhelmed when I saw that thing in his review. And so diversity. I feel that, and I've used the pointillism example in chapter four with the colored pictures. Uh, where I wanted to talk to you about that because uh, uh, this is a beautiful color. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if I open this up and, and show this, if they can see people, uh, you take, you you take correct. You, you 
So just explain this to uh, this. You say this emerged as a way of uh, understanding, uh, uh, you know, uh, portraits and paintings uh, sometime in the late 19th century, right? Yeah. Tell us uh, how you have applied it to, to your solution. See, I intentionally introduced this topic because in all the various podcasts that I have done since the 5th of September when the book was released, and no one has dared to pick up this pointillism example because they said it's too difficult for any audience to understand. They have to read the book. But essentially, pointillism is a simple technique which, as you point out, showed up in Impressionist art in the late 19th century. So the illusion of color comes not from the color of the pigments used, but from the positioning of colored points. That's why pointillism. Colored points, which may be of a color quite different from the color that is perceived. And when you actually see a pointillist picture in real life, when you go very close to the picture, it looks like nothing. It just looks like a collection of haphazard dots. So when you move back, suddenly the picture pops out. So gray, for example, a thing that looks gray in, in the picture from a distance, when you go very close, you'll see a mixture of orange, white, red, black, so many things. So coming back now to the book, and here this is why people should actually buy the book and read it, because no amount of explaining is, is going to convey. But for example, let me try it. Let me try this. See, the first picture is India with 28 states, you know, and you have various colors. There's a blue and there's a red in the bottom and so on. Now, very difficult. Okay, the second picture is India with 50 states. The third and fourth picture have India with 75 states and 750 states. So you see somewhere between 50 states and 75 states, the picture comes out. Now, the color of these dots is a diversity indicator. So if you take a typical state, for let's take language. Language was a good measure of diversity 50 years ago, 60 years ago. The answer, this pointillism thing came to me when I started thinking about Telangana, a state where I had lived for 30 years when it was in its undivided condition. And I was living in Hyderabad at that time, which is part of Telangana. And I'm quite familiar with coastal Andhra to know that these two places are quite different from each other, even though they speak nominally the same language, Telugu. The fact that the Telugu spoken in Telangana is slightly different is okay, it's beside the point, but they are very, very different. The people are very, very different. People in Telangana have been asking for a separate state since 1960. So, Andhra Pradesh was the first state that was formed on the basis of linguistic division. It is also the first non-Hindi speaking state to be divided. This clearly tells me that when the society becomes a little more sophisticated, a little more rich, a little more progressive. Language then becomes only a coarse indicator of diversity. And this is something which I want to tell the politicians of Tamil Nadu. Tamil may not be necessarily the best measure of diversity of that very big state. And therefore, I have divided the scheme that I propose, the solution as it were, is that instead of 75 states, have an India of 75 states. Now here the inspiration also is the Gandhian constitution of 1946, which was largely supervised, I would say, and even ghostwritten by Gandhi, where he asks for 750 states. That is a pure democracy right from the grassroots. And the constituent assembly considered that and decided not to go with that model, I think correctly. Because when you have 750 states, the center becomes very weak. So 
75, for reasons which I have justified in chapter 4, seem to be that golden number. Please remember, if the number of states is smaller, the diversity distribution is incomplete. If it is larger than that, the diversity description is superfluous. You don't need states smaller than that. And when I took history, geography, culture, language, religion, economics, everything, strategic value, the 75 states naturally fell out. It was not very difficult. Rajasthan, for example, I went back to the old princely states, which were all well governed. And I wanted to separate, for example, Mysore and Bangalore and put them in two different states. Various reasons have been explained. So the main idea of the book, the crux of this book is, you know, common uh, objection and criticism is that smaller states leads to balkanization. Now, this is true. This is true in a nation state. It is not true in a civilizational state. Because in a civilizational state, we have got a super canopy over all of us called Sanatana Dharma. So this Sanatana Dharma actually teaches you diversity. You know, any, any place where you have got six darshanas, six different ways of looking at the same thing, it respects diversity. So diversity is nothing. Diversity is actually our strength. You know, we say unity and diversity and all. Unity can never lead to diversity in a civilizational state. In a civilizational state, diversity and diversity alone can lead to unity because we've got this super thing that connects all of us. And if you look at uh, Vivekananda, Radha Krishna and all these people, they view it as actually neo-Hinduism. It is a canopy which rises above all religions. You know, and uh, it is this which is our strength. It is our biggest strength. And this is what makes us a civilizational state. And this is why I feel if the civilizational nature of this Bharat is emphasized in a new constitution, not a constitution with amendments anymore, please. We've had enough of them. Then this is important. We can become economically strong. And I know you want to ask me another question, but let me finish this last point. What do I mean by economically strong? I take my examples of the three K states, Kashmir, Kutch, and Congo. Now, Kashmir, I have put as a small state, just the valley, separate from Jammu. And I have, it is known that this place, uh, roses and lavender grow very well here. And if you make an economy out of rose oil and lavender oil, we can beat Bulgaria, which is the world leader in rose oil production. So we get an economy of this very small state called Kashmir, economically more powerful than Bulgaria. Now come to Kutch. Kutch is a large area state with a lot of sunshine and no rain. Hmm. Much larger in area than Israel, which is the world leader of solar energy. So Kutch actually can be the home of solar energy for the whole country, provided we have a way of getting cheap copper we can actually use Kutch and leverage and make it a more powerful economy than Israel. Similarly, I come to Congo, which is the area near Kovai and Tirupur and all that. This is already quite famous for the fabric and textile industry. You know, the machine looms. Now, if you, you talk to some of the people there, they say Chennai is too far away. You talk to people in Srinagar, they say Jammu is some planet away. And you, so you enhance this Tirupur Kovai belt industrially. There has also been a demand for separation of Congo for many decades. You can beat Bangladesh. So you see what I'm getting at. You will have 75 economic powerhouses. States will become economically strong. And the center becomes politically strong because the states become smaller. And you cannot, be, India, Bharat cannot afford big states like Tamil Nadu, West Bengal and Maharashtra anymore. These big states cannot be allowed to become politically powerful. Make them, make the small states economically strong. A center doesn't need to be economically strong. A center needs to be politically very strong. So you see the normal objection that strong center means weak state and the weak center means strong state. That is not valid if you make 75 states. You will get economically strong states and a politically strong center. So you have strong, strong. And that will happen if we properly recognize 
that we are civilizational. That essentially is what chapter four is all about. So let me let me push back against uh, this uh, notion of seventy-five states, right? Uh, Arun Shuri, in one of his books, I think it was uh, our parliamentary system that was published almost, I think, more than ten years back. One of the statistics that he presented was that a majority of the candidates to the Lok Sabha are elected. In fact, I think he said more than 75% of the candidates today are elected with less than 50% of the votes polled. Correct. In fact, there are some candidates who have been elected after polling only 10% of the votes uh, uh, polled, Correct. such as the, you know, is, is the fragmentation of the electorate. Now, if you end up with smaller states, couldn't one make the argument that uh, by appealing to their particular, uh, you know, caste or region or religion, a leader could essentially establish a de facto dynasty, uh, ignoring the rest of the people, knowing that uh, that particular, you know, quote unquote, vote bank that this politician appeals to will keep him and his family in power forever. Very sound question, and uh, I have the answer to that question in chapter four. I have said that the 75 states idea can only work, and that comes back to your original comment about Westminster, if there is a full separation between legislature and executive, like what is done in America. So if you have an elected president and elected governors who bring their own technocrat cabinets with them, and allow the elected representatives to do only the legislative work. None of these problems will arise. There is no question of dynasty. What dynasty? Each fellow after Stalin Udaynidhi has to come and stand for election on his own. Nobody can prop him up through the legislature which is going on now. Firstly, corruption will come down. Secondly, this craze to become ministers won't be there anymore because today, the fate of a, suppose a single party has majority in the Lok Sabha, which is what it is today. A member of parliament, a member of the Lok Sabha from that party who is not a minister, especially with the anti-defection law, is practically a useless person. He can go about cutting ribbons and opening some things in Delhi, that's all. He can't do anything else. So it actually loses the point of an electoral democracy. And this comes back again to the basic inadequate inadequacies of Westminster for our country. I have described in chapter two, that's why it's so long, that this Westminster system is the only country in the world that has an unwritten constitution. And of all things, we had to go and choose that as a model. Every other country in the world has got a written constitution and then we go and take this. And then we say Rajya Sabha, most of the members didn't want it. The only argument for Rajya Sabha is because it looks like House of Lords. Exactly. So, and you know, there are a number of irrational things done in that assembly also. I mean, let's not, I mean, those fellows were not gods. They were nationalistic people. There were no tukde tukdes in that constituent assembly. But they, sometimes I think they just, and uh, abolition of the upper houses is something I've strongly advocated throughout the book. I don't think they'll serve any purpose at all. I think, I mean, it's important that, you know, thinking people start questioning all this and not simply say that the constitution is unalterable, there's nothing you can do about it and we have to keep on doing our things. 105 yeah. amendments to the constitution and yet it is revered as some sort of an inviolable, uh, uh, you know, book to be worshipped. It is, is means a total lack of a thinking, thinking ability among the people. U.S. constitution Bizarre. is so old, 250 years old, only 27 amendments. It's the shortest constitution in the world. Ours is the longest. 140 years constitution. I mean, what are we doing with this kind of thing? And so many amendments each time something, even you have mentioned ninth schedule. It should not be there. If the constitution is so good, why do you need, need a ninth schedule? Can I ask you? Exactly. Now, what, if, what, was the 69%, what was that 69% of Jailalita all about? You know, and now this uh, recent thing, this EWS. 
and uh, whether EWS is going to cut into the, will the Supreme Court remove the cap of 50%? They say already it has removed, already it has not removed. There is so much doubt, ambiguity. I think when the thing is, it's becoming like what the Americans call a Rube Goldberg scheme. Uh, so putting so yes, many band-aids, somebody suffering from cancer and then you're trying to treat it by putting band-aids on the thing all the time. So here is, uh, uh, you know, you talk, you, you, you mentioned that there needs to be a complete separation of the legislature from the executive. How is, we are not even talking about something like that. In fact, we have, uh, we have the judiciary talking about the, taking over some of the functions of the legislature, of the executive office. So that leads me to believe that the eminent intellectuals of this country that are actually running this country, they seem to be veering in a direction that is opposite to what you are proposing. Yeah, I think they should bring more scientists and technocrats to decide all these things. No, because these guys, that's why I have spent so much time writing about Keshavan and the Bharati. Because Tell us a little bit about that case. We hear about it quite a lot in many contexts. In fact, I think this is the case, right, where you mentioned that uh, this argument of the basic structure of the Constitution first came into being. And without, and and people, I, okay, so I have seen a lot of people criticize uh, this the concept of the basic structure. And they say this, was, this is a fraud. And and I'm, I'm one of them. Them. But on the other hand, when this case came up, what was at stake was this attempt by Mrs. Indira Gandhi to basically destroy the constitution and they said you cannot. Uh, so tell us a little about, uh, uh, you know, about this context and history. It's a very, very interesting case. Many books have been written about it by very eminent people. And I have tried to summarize and nothing that I've written about Keshavananda Bharti is controversial. It's known. Mostly it was to, I mean, she was getting too high-handed and was threatening to usurp all powers within her physical self, you know. And uh, yeah, it was getting from bad to worse. It was a few years before the emergency, isn't it? Yeah, and so then this whole business of whether the powers of the legislature to do whatever it wanted to do. Also, the judgment, 7-6 seven, six judgment, reaffirmed the rights of the judiciary. And at that time, it was essential because otherwise, I think we would have lapsed, lapsed into some kind of a crude dictatorship, not befitting a country like this. So no excuses can be made for that. But what has happened as a result of that is gradually the judiciary have started moving into areas where they were never supposed to go. Like today's Supreme Court. Now I'm saying this even though tomorrow somebody may come and arrest me. Uh, the way they are going, they feel that their part of their remit is also to improve the country according to what they feel it should be improved, how it should be improved. Sorry, no. The very fact that you've got this collegium, the self-appointing fellows, is that you stay completely aloof from matters connected with how to improve this country. There are elected people for that. And then there is an executive who has been selected to be loyal to the constitution, who will faithfully execute the wishes of the legislature. They are the people who will help the country, not the judges. The judges, especially the judges of the Supreme Court, have to adjudicate the legal points and the legal aspects of laws passed by parliament. Whether the laws passed by parliament are in accordance with the constitution, that's it. For one judge said the other day something about the hijab case, what Muslim girls have to study, that's none of his business. Whether Muslim girls have to study or they are not able to study, if they are not allowed to go to school, that is not his business. And the problem with the Supreme Court, as they say, the Supreme Court is right because it is the last. It is not the last because it is correct. 
There is very, nothing on very interesting. See, so therefore, whatever those fellows say, including now some of their off the cuff remarks, which they seem to be making as they are coming to their judgments, none of this gives the public, general public, a feeling of any great confidence in them. And in the end, I am very emphatic about this. It is not their business to improve the country. It's not their business at all. There are many others. The elected people are there, I say. What are the what are the MPs and the MLAs? That is their full-time job. And then they'll tell the executive and the executive will carry it out. So this is actually it's reached a kind of a silly point now. I don't know where all this is going to end. And uh, because several important things are coming up, UCC is coming up, you know, and certain things they don't want to look at it. Some of the killings in Kashmir and so on, they don't want to take up those cases. They take up selective cases. Some cases at midnight, they take it up. Other things go on for years and years. For example, the <clears throat> Sabarimala case, uh, it's an absurd judgment that they passed. I'd say it. Because it, uh, so, people have uh, people have argued threadbare about it. The fact that there are many IFPs, but only that particular shrine is a Naistika Brahmachari. So, so it's that's not a, a very it's interesting not a point. It's not a question. See, a Muslim woman wanted to enter the temple saying it's my right to go there. See, this is this is where it's getting into mischievous ground. This is a very interesting comment you make, uh, Professor, because uh, two two reasons. The first one is mm -hmm. that uh, the original petitioners in the case at one point themselves wanted to withdraw the case, but the court did not let them withdraw the case. It said, we will go ahead and pass judgment, which they did. And the yes. second is, uh, since we are talk uh, talking about your book that has been published by Vitasta uh, Publications, I would also say that people should go and take another, uh, take a look at another book published by Vitasta, which was uh, The Sabrimala Confusion, Menstruation Across Cultures by Nitin okay. Sridhar, which is a wonderful okay. book on the topic. Exactly. Exactly. Because we need to know, public needs to educate itself more. And I keep emphasizing to the public. Please, please, please do not go into Twitter and Facebook so much. Read the original literature and form your own opinions. In fact, I put the reading list and not references and I've written. Don't read my book. Just go to the reading list and then write your own book after that. Exactly. You have a, a Vivekananda reader. You also uh, reference writings uh, 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 you know, by J.S.I. Deepak, by Harsh and Rajiv Mantri, by Ruchir Sharma, you uh, uh, refer. Aravind and Nilakandan, Sandeep Balakrishna. There are so many people. You know, the uh, Sandeep Balakrishna and Aravind and Nilakandan are not pop stars. But I think we have to read their works very, very carefully. We have to go back to Dharampal. We have to go to Sitaram Goel. And I think Absolutely. there's got to be a critical mass of people who are all writing broadly in the same direction. I hope my book is, a, you know, a small contribution to this, what I would feel is a national effort. And I think it is part of making India into Bharat. We must write in a cogent fashion without emotionalism and in the sense of realism. And as you said correctly, not worshipping this thing like some holy book. You know, yesterday Constitution Day was full of all this holy book stuff. Silly. Have any of you read that Constitution? Have you all read the debates before you start, you know, yakking off in Twitter about uh, it's being a, it's a great thing that we've got. And, and yesterday Kharge said something. BJP is mutilating the Constitution. RSS is mutilating. Anybody feels they can say whatever they want now. This is why I'm really disappointed Abhinav, about the level of general public discourse in our country about important matters. When you take important, when you take famous countries, great countries in the world, there was free, frank, and honest and logical debate in the educated public. This I don't find in India. So there are two observations here, Professor. We are uh, running out of time. I just want to make two observations. The first one is that uh, it was the expectation and the hope among a lot of people that as internet democratized the availability of information, we would end up having a more informed discourse as more people would have access to more information. But it seems that in 
some cases we have actually gone a further level down to the level of TikTok when it comes to the discourse that takes place in the country today. The second one is that the the space for the free expression of ideas and thoughts has actually reduced in the in recent years where there are some thoughts and ideas that one cannot even talk about with unless and until one is ready for some serious consequences ranging from you know just the inconvenient to the fatal so that is actually a very sad reflection on where we seem to be progressing but coming back to your book i want to uh, you know first so how you have reading uh, 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 a list a reading list in your book you lay out the arguments in the first three chapters and then you propose a solution and then you go to, to go on to talk about it in the fourth chapter in closing what are the kinds of questions that that you think uh, people who read the book should be asking uh, of themselves uh, in their uh, in the company of their friends and of our elected representatives well i think educated people some of them are asking these questions why have we all been quiet for so long some people say we didn't people who read my book said that we didn't realize things were this bad and we didn't know many of the facts subhash actually told me you mentioned his name early in the podcast he said there were many facts in in this book that i didn't even know about before i read the book and again coming from him i was greatly enthused because he is one of the most knowledgeable people about <clears throat> modern india and the connections from between the old and the new so i think first one has to make oneself informed uh, then one has to start wondering about whether this is our only fate to keep living with this 1950 constitution with its amendments will we still find you know bengal and tamil nadu and maharashtra doing whatever they like and with a sort of weakish center you know having the majority in the lok sabha but really not able to do too much with it and whether it's just going to keep drifting on and on and everybody says adjust karo adjust karo and the corruption keeps going up and up because if if we stay on like this then all the glorious visions set forth by prime minister for 2047 those will be all just like whistling in the dark you know you can't have 100% reservation and go to that place sorry you can't not now anyway unless we become a tertiary in economy in which case caste itself doesn't become so important that's another thing huh? this whole caste nonsense will only be there as long as we are relatively poor and there is more money some of these things will automatically come down i i'd also like to mention we don't have time to get into that but you also mentioned that once we attain a critical mass of maybe 5 trillion as an economy you mentioned some people consider that the figure to be 10 trillion we will have become too big and economically strong for outsiders to influence uh, Uh, our country and and I'll invite people to go read the book because there is a lot of such information there are a lot of such nuggets and very there's not only incisive analysis on the one hand but there are also these lot of thought provoking questions that that I think come to mind as you read this book so I would definitely encourage people we have been talking with professor Gautam Desi Raju honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore who has written this book Bharat India 2.0 which has been published by Vitasta Publications we have uh, uh, this is available uh, from the website from Amazon and so on and uh, we will put this video up it is available on youtube uh, we will add this to our playlist of uh, our uh, q and a uh, list of authors but uh, uh, professor before i leave the last word to you i would like to say this is uh, certainly one of the uh, uh, a notable book that i think anyone interested in finding out learning more and figuring out how to frame the debate around the current state of india and its future should uh, give this book a read uh, discuss this book with others and i hope it uh, reaches a far wider audience uh, uh, than it already is i'd like to congratulate you once again on the on writing researching this this excellent book and uh, 
to our listeners who have come on and will watch this uh, this uh, webcast available on YouTube, Facebook. I'd like to leave you now with the last words. The last word is what I have written as the theme of the book. Uh, India did not start this war, but Bharat will finish it. Memorable lines uh, indeed. And with that, thank you, Professor, and thank you all for watching. Thank you, Abhinav.